So when Will first asked me to come here, he said, well, you should talk about some of the projects you're doing. And some of the projects have a big impact on the world. And I said, well, we think that energy is a huge problem. There aren't any um, uh, good forms of carbon-free energy that work 24 hours a day. And we're working on an experimental nuclear reactor. This is actually a computer rendering of that reactor. I thought, that'll be great. I'll give a fast pitch on fast nucle nucleonics and reactors. Because surely everyone in Seattle wants an experimental nuclear reactor built right here in our own backyard, right? <laughs> well, we actually do all of the uh, computer simulation for this uh, in our backyard. We do this in Bellevue. And it's a very ambitious long-term project. Uh, it's the world's safest nuclear reactor. But the really cool thing is it actually burns nuclear waste as its fuel. Um, and you could actually run every home in the United States for a thousand years based on waste we already have in the country. Um, so that's kind of dramatic. So well, I'll talk about that, but then ah, that might be a little bit too nerdy. So, well, I can talk about my cookbook, um, <laughs> which really has nothing to do with social innovation, but it's kind of cool. Um, uh, and you know, you folks haven't eaten for several hours, so I'll, I'll have your rapt attention if I talk about food. Um, this is one of the things I've spent the last five years doing is creating this uh, five volume, six volume actually set of uh, cookbooks. Um, then this year we have a, a new version, Modernist Cuisine at Home, which is the sort of the smaller, slim, only 684 page volume. Hmm? Um, this is a lab where we make our cookbook. This is over in Bellevue. Um, and if it looks like a mad scientist lab, I I'm not mad. Um, <laughs> But that sort of is the idea. And here we do all kinds of interesting things in food science. Uh, a lot for the book, but a lot for some of the projects we're going to talk about later. Um, this is our machine shop. Um, I highly recommend having a machine shop. It lets you uh, cut pots in half and do all kinds of things like, uh, like this. Um, the people at Viking were nice enough to loan us a stove. <laughs> Never loan us equipment, just by the by. Um, after cooking with it for about six months, we decided to see what it looked like inside. So here we, we cut it in half. Um, and uh, it's a little bit like the 4-H kid gets a little, cow, a little calf and they grow it up and then, oops, it has to go to market. So we take these photos so that we can show people a visual uh, indication of what's going on in your equipment, in your food, while it cooks. It's the, sort of the magic Superman x-ray vision view of what's going on. And uh, that's one example. Here's another one. Watch this really closely. This is popcorn. We have this awesome camera that takes high-speed videos. And there it opens up. <laughs> and the, the thing I love about this is it makes both a science point the science point is that when water boils to steam, it expands in volume by about a factor of 1,600. So what you were seeing there is that the uh, water inside the popcorn had, was starting to turn to steam. And a tiny crack formed. And it became a steam rocket that was actually shooting up. And then as it rose, it kept trying to relieve pressure. But eventually, that crack propagated, and boom, it opens up. Uh, here's, here's another video. This is uh, using a zester um, on an orange. And you don't realize that you could do Star Wars quality explosions with an orange, <laughs> uh, typically. But in fact, a lot of the flavor that comes from oranges is in oil. And that oil is mostly in the skin. That's why that little gadget called a zester works to put orange zest in. So we thought, well, is it flammable? Oh, yeah, it's flammable. <laughs> but that's not really what I came here to talk about. I, today, I wanted to talk about inventing miracles. Now, the technology industry has transformed all of our lives. Uh, we have computers and tablets and smartphones. Uh, it's enormously fun. And probably everyone in this room has had their lives transformed in some way by technology. And that's fantastic. But we actually didn't need our lives changed all that much. I mean, it gets fun. It's great. It was living for me and for Will when we were at Microsoft. But we didn't really need to have our lives change that much. And so you know, we can get this great app called Uber. This allows you to call a car and driver whenever you want it, which is really cool. But that's not all everyone in the world can afford a car and driver. 
Um, and so the same thing is true of almost all these other things. They're great. It's great that you can kill aliens um, with Xbox at a faster rate than ever before. But <laughs> we didn't need our lives changed. But the fact is there are people who do need their lives changed. Um, now, wh why do, does the tech industry focus on this? Because you make a lot of money doing this. Okay? The technology industry, which I love and I'm part of, and I'm totally guilty of this, the technology industry is about making tools and toys for rich people. And sometimes I, I mean what we would call rich people in the United States, but frankly, everyone in the United States is rich people compared to the world. And so while it's wonderful to make tools and toys for the, for the wealthiest people on Earth and to transform their lives and take really good lives and make them even better, uh, there's an interesting question of, is that all that technology is about? Is that all that technical creativity is about? We don't think so. <clears throat> Here's a, a book by Paul Collier. He's an economist at Oxford University in England. It's called The Bottom Billion. In fact, there's a lot of people on Earth that aren't that well off. Um, you know, in this country, we had this series of uh, protests, the Occupy movement. Um, I happened to be on the Harvard campus when Occupy Harvard was going on, and they handed me this leaflet in the top. It said, we are the 99%, and I couldn't help myself. I said, not of SAT scores. <laughs> and, you know, it's great to talk about the difference between the 1% and the 99% in this country, and it's a very healthy dialogue. But the fact is, the 99% in the U.S., if you look globally, is actually the 14%. And there are two and a half billion people that live on an average income of $2 a day. And it's very hard uh, to, to be in our society and not, uh, well, actually, it's pretty easy to be in our society and forget about those folks. But if you really think about trying to live on $2 a day, that is a crushing burden. Uh, the people that have that have some horrible problems. You know, in, just to take one problem, malaria, every 43 seconds, a child is dying. 2,000 a day. Now, if that was happening here, we'd do something about it. Okay? Effectively, zero children a year die in the United States of malaria. Um, in fact, malaria is a very interesting disease in that malaria is a disease of poverty. Um, if you can get something like $5,000 a year per capita income, uh, you don't have malaria because there's a series of things between uh, health care and having an organized society about things like um, mosquito breeding programs and so forth, you don't have malaria. But you go, uh, you go below that and you definitely have malaria. So there's a couple of uh, solutions to problems like this. Uh, the normal solutions are uh, various aid agencies around the world. They try to do a whole lot of good things. They do a lot of good things. But if you talk to people who are engaged in these important issues, you say, so how are we going to make enormous progress? They look at you like you're an idiot. Because they say, no, 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 you don't understand. I mean, it's a little bit like the, um, the line from the movie, it's Chinatown, Jake. You know, they, they say, hey, look, this is, this is Africa, this is poverty. Don't, don't be so foolish as to expect miracle solutions. Um, and so all of these organizations do wonderful things but those wonderful things aren't wonderful enough to fundamentally change the problem. And maybe that's the best that it can be. That I, that's absolutely a possible thing. But uh, at my company, we got really interested in saying, maybe there's something else we could do. Maybe there's a different approach that we could take. And I'm not saying this is for everybody, but it's an approach that, that we've gone down. And that's that inventing is magic. You know, if you take a classic notion of magic, say in Harry Potter, somebody thinks something or says something and maybe waves a wand a little bit, and amazing things occur. And of course, in real life, that doesn't happen, except, except when it comes to new ideas. Because there's really no, there's no law of physics that says an idea can't go. Uh, there's laws of physics that say I'm not going to jump very high or very fast. And a, a lot of laws of bad living probably also in my case. But you know, there are, there's some real physical limits to some things, but there's no physical limits to ideas. And the reason our lives have been transformed is because of ideas. 
Hundreds of years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, uh, Western Europe or the United States didn't have um, any kind of, the, their infant mortality rates, their malaria rates, their things like that were actually uh, no better than Africa's. In fact, as recently as 1935, there was half a million cases of malaria a year in the United States. So and there, there are malaria, uh, mosquitoes with the potential to carry malaria in Washington state. It's not a disease of the tropics. People think, oh, it's the tropics. Well, the reason they think it's the tropics is because the tropics are poor. Um, in the 19th century, uh, uh, malaria extended above the Arctic Circle. So anyway, inventing is magic. So can we use the magic of invention to do something for all the people in the world that, uh, that aren't as fortunate as for the people that don't need more tools and toys? Well, that brings us to an interesting when you talk to people who are experienced in this business, they say, but, but that, we tried that. It's not going to work. And oh gosh, here's a story about a bunch of naive technologists, and they brought some high-tech thing here, and it didn't work. See, it doesn't work. You shouldn't do that again. Well, I have an answer to that. And the answer to that, this will show how old you are. Um, <laughs> You know, Lycos, Excite, Hotbot, AltaVista, they didn't work either. They didn't work. All of them, oh, they had a brief day in the sun, none of them worked. They're all dead now. So you never should start a search engine, right? Well, of course, Google uh, came and had a better business model. Um, and Google has become one of the great companies in the world and is an incredible force. Um, my friends at Microsoft are working hard with Bing. The point is, lots of failures doesn't mean you can't do it. Now, in, those case, in the previous case, uh, with search engines, each of those had a little bit of a day in the sun. But uh, here's another category like that. Here's electronic books. Uh, I have a whole collection of electronic books. <laughs> um, and for years and years, when I was at Microsoft, and, and even before that, some new electronic book would come out. And I think this is great, because uh, now, finally, we're going to have uh, ebooks. And I knew ebooks had to work because they were in Star Trek. So, you know, by the 23rd century, no problem. We all have ebooks. But ebooks were a complete litany of failure until Amazon in introduced Kindle. And so, the lesson I take from this is you don't actually have to always succeed. And so, in fact, if you don't embrace failure, you're almost certainly losing something because it's by embracing failure that you actually can find the things that are really valuable. And maybe the most important idea from the technology industry isn't the specific technology. It's not all about software or smartphones or some specific thing. The most important idea is to say, keep failing, but incent people enough that they keep trying. Because if they do keep trying time and time again, they're going to get something. So here's a sports uh, analogy, which is it's always dangerous when I give a sports analogy because it's, it's sort of like me talking in a foreign language. But here's uh, Miguel Cabrera. He's a great baseball player. He has a 330 batting average. So I looked that up. That means 67% of the time he gets out. Cabrera is not a hitter. Cabrera is a misser. Okay? He misses twice for every time he hits. Okay? That's terrible. No, actually it isn't. The way the game of baseball works, it's okay to fail. It's okay if you fail twice as often as you succeed. Now the thing that's amazing about invention is that invention is even uh, more concentrated than, uh, than baseball. So a typical batting average for inventors, we don't really know. It's, it, when you've got a baseball, you've got these wonderful rules, and you have referees, and you can score, and so you can keep these statistics really well. With inventors, it's less clear, but I estimate I've got about a 40 batting average. And there's, some people might say, gee, I'm, I'm exaggerating that. Um, but you know, it's perfectly fine if 96% of my ideas don't work, so long as the ones that work are powerful enough. That's what it's really about. It's, this is not a game where you should count strikes or you should count misses. This is a, inventing is a game where you count the power of the idea. 
And I think that this is probably the single most important thing we could do for social innovation is to get this idea of risk aversion out of our heads and get an idea of saying you've got to try things until you get something that works. Yes, learn from it. Yes, stop beating your head against the wall. If you keep beating your head against the wall forever, that's a problem. You should find a softer spot in the wall. Um, but if you're so adverse that you don't try things, you're never going to get the high payoff wins. So we've got a program, uh, we call it Global, Global Good. It's about inventing for the bottom billion. And I'm just gonna talk about a, a couple of, of things. Uh, our company does this as a um, almost certainly pro bono uh, thing. I say almost certainly, because there's always some chance that we'll find a rich world application for some of the ideas there. And we're always open to that because when an idea is new, it's usually more expensive and doesn't work quite as well. Um, one of the great things about the technology industry is a concept called early adopters. Uh, these are the people who are willing to buy the stuff that doesn't really work. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, when I was early in my days of the industry, I, I loved those people from afar. Um, as my income grew, I became one of those people. I figured it was only fair. Um, Using the rich world as an early adopter is one good strategy. When it works, it doesn't always. So here's, uh, I'm gonna tell you, tell you in detail about one project and then just sketch a couple of others. So vaccines are an incredibly important way of doing healthcare in the developing world. And they're important because your immune system remembers, which means if you go to the effort to inoculate a child, you may give that child uh, immunity for life for many diseases, or at least for, for childhood for many others. So you can't give that child constant health care because there is no health care system. But if you can do the heroic act of getting there with a vaccine, it's great. Okay? Trouble is, 20% of the vaccines spoil before delivery. And that's because it's Chinatown, Jake. You know, the stuff happens, the uh, bridge washes out, the power station goes down, the guy who's supposed to deliver the propane tanks isn't there, and, and it's also hot, <laughs> uh, so stuff spoils. So there's a lot of approaches you can take to this. One approach is to create a whole logistic system for shipping propane around. Turns out most of Africa's vaccines go, are used in propane-powered um, uh, refrigerators. And believe it or not, you can power a refrigerator on propane. Then there's people saying, oh, let's make a solar-powered refrigerator. And those are great, except they're about $10,000 a piece, so it's pretty hard to get them to the places that really need them. Um, now, this isn't just a financial issue. You know, 20% of an expensive vaccine is, is hard if you've got the budget of one of these countries. But if you don't vaccinate kids, some of them will die before you get to them again. So there are hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths every year. So we thought this was a really interesting problem. So we tried to examine this problem from every possible angle. We looked at solar powered refrigerators. We looked at all kinds of things. And eventually, we came up with this. It's a device which will hold vaccines without any power, or hold them, keep them cold, for months with no power at all. Because after a while, we realized the one thing we could really count on was nothing happening. That, you know, if you count on nothing, if you just assume this thing is going to, to be there with no power, no help, no, nothing else, and it can last for months, that would work. Well, first, the first couple of them looked like this. They weighed about 100 pounds. Um, then we kept optimizing them and optimizing them and doing more tests. Now they're starting to look a little cooler. Um, we go to Africa. Um, in fact, we've got a team in Africa almost every month of the year now. Uh, where we go and bring our various devices out and say, hey, can we actually, how do these work? Are they going to work in this actual environment? Um, uh, you know, this thing we thought was for a pickup truck, we discovered, no, actually, that's for a motorcycle um, because the <laughs> highway safety laws aren't what they are here. You might as well go with it for a while. This is what it looks like now. This is our latest prototype, and we'll be shipping a bunch of these to Africa in January. Uh, the point here is that by having a bunch of really clever ideas about a technological problem, we came up with a solution that was very different than what people had before. And it was different because we broke a bunch of rules. So one of the interesting things is that there was, we discovered there was a WHO spec for the refrigerators. 
And there was two kinds of, there's either a sort of a stationary refrigerator and a mobile refrigerator, and ours classified as mobile. Well, they wanted the thing to cost $100. Now, that's great to have it cost only $100, but pretty much by the time you spec it's $100, it's an ice chest. It doesn't work very well. Meanwhile, they were putting $10,000 worth of vaccine, which was spoiling 20% of the time. So you could afford a lot more. But the rule said 100 bucks. So this is one of these examples where we cheerfully just ignored the rule. Because, and, and this is actually one of the great techniques for invention. Uh, take something, uh, the, take a rule, or sometimes even a physical law, and pretend it doesn't exist or doesn't work. And break it. Then see if you can backfill afterwards. Now in this case, once we have the device that would last for months, we said, well, oh, sure, we could actually make the thing more expensive. And ours, we don't know what the final price is going to be, but if it came in at $500 and it saved thousands, thousands of dollars worth of vaccine every year, I and mean, it was going to last a few years, that's a good trade-off. So that's one example of how having an idea about inventing a high-tech thing, the, the inspiration for this came from cryogenic doers. The reason we thought we could do this is we have liquid nitrogen in our lab that we use for, actually for the cookbook. Um, <laughs> and liquid helium that we use for some solid state physics experiments. This stuff is intensely cold, and it lasts for a really long time because you have a really, really good thermos for it. So why, well, if we made a really good thermos, could we keep the vaccine cold? And it turned out the answer was we could. Here's another view of it. This is what it looks like if you cut it open. We're, we're big on cutting things open. Um, here's a couple of other projects. We have a project here in milk pasteurization. Um, pasteurization was one of the great discoveries of uh, science of all time. Oh, actually, here, well, well, watch the video, too. Here, this is a uh, model of malaria, uh, a computer model of malaria sweeping across Madagascar. And if you watch here, we have one of our most fun uh, projects. Uh, this, we have a device that detects mosquitoes in the sky and shoots them down with lasers. <laughs> and. <laughs> Here's, watch this. Here's another one, bang, he gets hit with laser right now and down they go. <laughs> it's, besides, well, yeah, it's just very satisfying to watch. <laughs> um, and we always say, you know, we're hoping we can make it practical for widespread deployment in Africa, but it, if it just goes with a sharper image so we can watch, people can watch this happen on your porch, that might be enough. Um, and anyway, all together we've got about 20 of these projects where we've decided to say let's take a bunch of high-tech ideas, let's take a bunch of inventors, let's sit around and brainstorm really out-of-the-box solutions. And you know something? Most of them will fail. And I am completely okay with that. Thanks very much. <laughs>